This is part two of the custom boom bracing clamp project for a pair of high gain 432 MHz Yagi beam antennas which are to be installed 70 feet up a mast in the Netherlands. The brief is that the clamps must be effectively invisible to the radio frequency signal so there's no measurable effect on the beam pattern or the side lobes in the vertical or horizontal planes. Delrin's a reasonable choice as the clamps are tiny compared with a wavelength so dielectric losses and loading are negligible and fixing GRP bracing tubes to Delrin is simple. Metal clamps would be much more difficult to connect without causing stress points and would mean conductive material extending some way into the electric field of the antenna. There are better plastics for this but I had some Delrin in stock. Sadly it was round not flat so there's a bit of extra machining to do but Machining's fun, right? Step one's to machine a flat on the side of the pucks which are to become the saddles. That's a 22mm two flute high speed steel end mill with a weld on shank that I got at a highly attractive price from Cutwell. Hashtag not sponsored in one of their flash sales and yes there is a damn great chip knocked off the corner of one flute caused when I overcooked a heavy cut on some aluminium and hit the tip of a high tensile 10 mm bolt in a threaded hole. It still cuts Delrin okay, Dinar make a bang. A couple of extra spacers raises the work pieces up so the finish size is above the vice jaws. I'll touch the tool up on the spacers and zero the DRO. I'll pop them back in cut side down and cut them to the finished height. One of my viewers chided me about saying Delrin was invisible to RF. As a test I put a block of the stuff in between the second and third directors of my 70 sem Yagi and blasted it for 10 minutes at 400 watts. The block actually cooled down. So the 0.02 loss tangent isn't much of an issue when it's small compared with the wavelength. Also there was no change in the resonance or match of the antenna. If that's not invisible it is at least of negligible visibility but just try fitting having negligible effective impact on the return loss or radiation pattern into a snappy 50 character YouTube title or on a thumbnail. It ain't happening. The spigot sides of the clamps need a different work holding approach. I'm using an ER40 collet block in the vise with a 20mm collet to grip the spigot shaft. Somebody picked up the wrong spanner, then tried to play it cool and pretend nothing happened. Uncool man, deeply uncool. I need to zero the DRO with the cutter flush with the reference face underneath the body, so I'm extending the face outwards with a ruler to touch off the cutter.
think this looks good, so now I'm going to put a flat on each end. I can't extend the flat to the full width because the original material diameter wasn't sufficiently large. Next operation is to deck the top to the finished height. These large spigots need a 40mm slot cutting. Slot size is good with about a 0.2mm clearance. A quick deburr off camera and it's on to the next part. This is the first of the four 30mm clamp spigots. The smaller clamps need a 30mm slot. Holding those 7mm stainless threaded inserts for machining the parted off ends isn't straightforward, so I'm making a collet with a pocket 7mm diameter and 3.5mm deep. That's enough to allow the 4mm unthreaded collars to be faced off and deburred.
That's a 7mm 3 flute high speed steel end mill. It should give me a reasonably flat bottomed hole. I think that'll do. Off camera I intended using the bandsaw to make three cuts at 60 degree intervals. That went really well. Two will have to do. Seeing as that rough and ready collet worked in the lathe, let's see if it'll work in the mill. I've rigged up a backstop for the collet using a scrap of round bar and a second collet block that helps to balance the load on the vice jaws anyway. I'm going to cut screwdriver slots in the end of the threaded inserts using a 1mm slitting saw. Wish me luck. Time to square off the ends of the 30mm saddles. Apologies for the weird whirring noise in the background. It was caused by a thing that made a weird whirring noise. I made the weird whirring noise go away by turning off the thing that made the weird whirring noise. My vice stop doesn't fit this new vice so I'm using machinist clamp.
One, two, three, four. Neil, I'm not sure I believe my visual senses, but is that perchance another of your horrific sketchy setups? Oh yes, it is. How unsurprising. It would be a huge help to me if you felt able to click the like button. YouTube's algorithm really likes likes. I'm not in the mood for deploying the Hymer today, so I'm going with the frictional rotary edge finder instead. It works, it's simple, and it doesn't matter if I drop it. If I drop the Hymer, I'd be sad, properly sad. I suppose you could argue that it would be better to make an alignment fixture which locates the inside edges of the upside down U and provides an offset reference, but I was careful to make sure the cutout was centralised so only the spacings really matter. I'm drilling the clearance holes to 4.2mm with lots of pecking to prevent chip packing and overheating.
The counterboards are 7mm, a little undersized for the pressed in threaded inserts and collars. I made sure the drill stopped at the right depth by using the mill depth stop. Nominative determinism in action perhaps? It's a good name, describes what it does. That's all the counterboards drilled, so now it's time to press in the long threaded and slotted stainless inserts using the mill vise to start with. That gets us to the point where the inserts flush with the top of the saddle, so now I need to press it in further using a bolt. Butterfingers. Honestly, he's such a clumsy oaf. Oh dear, is this mic still on? Oops. Now for the spigot side of the clamps. Once more, I've set the part on a parallel and tightened the vise, then aligned the spigot to ensure it's concentric with the mill axis, using a dial test indicator fixed into the chuck and turning the spindle, and then adjusting the table until the variation's under 10 micrometres and zeroing the DRO. Owing to an unfortunate camera dysfunction, which would need a time machine to remedy the defect, we'll have to slip into cyberspace to see the end result, or stare at a blank screen. You can get the same effect by closing your eyes now if you like. And relax, and now you can open your eyes. Observant listeners will notice I chose a bolt that's too long, so now I have to turn it round. Amy would be impressed. Look at those stress marks. Those inserts are too big, or the walls are too thin. You're a terrible designer as well as a terrible machinist. One more stainless insert to press into place and then we can get on with the anti-split collars. The anti-split collars are made from Delrin and they're a push fit over the 24mm GRP tubes. A clearance hole is drilled through the collar and the GRP and a self-tapping screw is used to lock them to the spigot. That drill's 21.5mm so I need to bore out the hole to 23.8mm so it's a good tight fit on the 24mm OD of the GRP tube. I need six of the anti-split rings, but as usual I made eight, just for luck.
So that's six anti-split collars, four small saddles, four small spigots, two large spigots and saddles, eight long threaded nuts, eight short ones, 16 plain inserts, eight long bolts, eight short ones, all ready to ship. They'll be holding those two damn great big Yagi beams high in the air in all sorts of weather, sending big signals over extreme distances and maybe even winning some radio contests. Link to part one is up there if you haven't watched it already and YouTube thinks you'll enjoy that one too.